welcome back. This is session 1608. This is an impromptu inserted session to talk about what is new in the just updated Pixelmator Pro version 1.1 codename Monsoon. They've added a, a few tweaks, a few adjustments, a few new features in there, and we're just going to take this unexpected episode uh, to, to go through those very quickly. So this will be fairly short. There's not a whole lot in here, but let's take a look at what we've got. So over to, let's get to the right screen up, over to Pixelmator Pro, we have, we have, um, the way you see exactly what's new, well, first of all, when you first launch it, after it's been updated, you're going to get a screen that pops up that shows you what's new. If you've dismissed that and you're going, wait, where did that go? I want to see what it was. All you have to do is go to the help menu and choose what's new in Pixelmator Pro. It will pop up the exact same screen. And you'll see there's a list of things in here. Export for web, touch bar, auto color adjustments, slice tool, advanced compression, quick export, export presets, SBG, HEIF support, live previews, select color range, and tutorials. So we're not going to go through quite everything in here, but let's start off with the first one, export for web. And incidentally, each one of these has a learn from more. You click on that, it opens up a web page that will tell you exactly what it is. And I got to say that they've really done a good job of making kind of a, a, well, there is the whole help system that's built in, which is great as well. But just this web page is really in depth and shows a lot of stuff. So if you have any questions about what any of these are, just hit the website, hit that learn more, and it's going to tell you everything you need. But for now, Let's actually take a look at it ourselves. So export for web, a modern way to easily prepare images for the web. So what happens is, let's say this picture is ready to go onto the interwebs. If I go up to the file menu, you'll see there's a new menu, export for web. Bring that up, and what you've got in here is, uh, let me get rid of the slices. I don't want the slices on there. Uh, how do I get rid of that slice? I added this earlier when I was playing. There we go, it's gone. Okay, what we've got is our image here. Um, you have your Format, optimize PNG, JPEG, GIF, or SVG, scalar, scalable vector graphics. You can choose a scaling for that. So if you're doing retina display type stuff, at least I think that is what that's for, retina display type images, you can scale there. Um, but what's really exciting about this, what I think is most interesting, is that you can add multiple formats at once. So let's say that I need a JPEG at full size, and then I want to add a, uh, I don't know, a PNG for whatever reason. Um, we'll add a PNG, we're going to do that at half size. Now when I hit export, I'm going to get both of these at once. I think that's really cool. That can be a big time saver. And if you have something that you do all the time, let's say that, um, let's do it like this. Let's say, let's not do PNG. Let's do JPEG. And um, can I change? I guess I can only do half size. I can't do, I was hoping I'd punch in the number. Um, but if you need those different scaled images, again, mainly for web developers type of a thing, you need to export your graphics at multiple sizes for retinas. Let's say buttons, that's a common thing, right? You're doing buttons. Um, you need your buttons at standard and at retina size, so 2x size. And this would be a great place to do that. And you can save that as a preset. So you can pull up that preset, hit export, and you have that same preset every time. So I like that. This also has a slicing feature. Now, I got to admit, I didn't think the web was did anybody did this on the web anymore? Um, did slicing, but maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. But the idea behind the slicing is I could go in here and take a piece of an image, um, slice this up so that we have additional slices in here, so that I could have them load up then in a um, it's like puzzle pieces. So you have smaller pieces of pieces of the image loading up at once, or what this could also be. Actually, you know, now that I think about it, this is a bit more of a probably more sensible use of this, is to export out. Um, different aspect ratios of an image. So let's say that, and I do this, and I actually do this all the time with Affinity Photo, is um, I create an image and I'll create a file size, uh, an aspect ratio that is for um, YouTube is 16 by 9, Facebook at is it 1610, I forget the aspect ratio, um, Twitter, which is 2 to 1. Like I'll create all these different ones. And here you could set up those slices, those crops in advance. So I think you can do it, as I was originally saying, slicing out for web developing delivery and slices. Although again, I don't think anybody does that anymore. Um, but now that I've, I'm playing with it just a little bit more here, I'm realizing this is probably much more useful to say, right, slice two is going to be my um, my Facebook size. Let's see, and I can I can change that. So we'll call that my Facebook size. And I'd have to look up what that is, uh, what that aspect ratio is, and uh, size that up like that. So I could have different aspect ratios of the same photo ready to export. And I think that would be quite cool. Incidentally, um, I'm going to show you a web page. I'm going to go I'm going to look this up while you're not looking at my screen real quick. Make sure I find it. I have this web page that I use often. Um, it's no easy way for me to include the link to this because anywhere. But um, if you Google search, okay, here we go. If you Google search this, always up to date social media image sizes cheat sheet. Okay, if you Google search that, I think you're going to find it. It is a Google Doc that has, you look down at the bottom, tabs for all the major social media platforms. 
and they tell you exactly what the size and or aspect ratio should be for each different uh, type of image and location. So for example, um, shared image, that's probably your most common one. So shared image on the timeline, 1200 by 630 is your recommended dimensions. Uh, most importantly, your aspect ratio, 1.91 to 1. So there's, there you got that. If I go to Twitter, optimize for Twitter um, in-stream photo, that's what I'm looking at. Recommended dimensions, 506 by 253. There's a minimum here. There's a maximum. So if you do any bigger than that, it's just going to get scaled down. So you may as well just upload it at that size. Image scale, aspect ratio, 2 to 1. Right. So you can get that information in here. Super, super useful. If you bookmark this, and you can actually subscribe to this page. This isn't my page. Somebody else is doing this. Um, but it's open to the public. You bookmark it. You subscribe to it. You'll get an email whenever it gets updated. So that's awesome. But I use this all the time because I always think, what was the aspect ratio? What was the um, maximum size again? Go back to here and you can see them all. So, and, and again, you'll see them for you got Instagram, you got LinkedIn, Pinterest, Google Plus. Anybody using that anymore? Um, YouTube and Tumblr are all listed in here. So it's a pretty slick tool. It's totally free. Um, oh, it looks as free tool by Sprout that's doing it. So again, just Google always up to date social media image sizes cheat sheet. Here, I'll load up the URL if someone actually wants to do a screen grab and find it. Um, Yep, there you go. So if you have uh, if you were to screen grab that, you could find that and retype the whole thing if you really couldn't find it otherwise. Okay, so with that said, let me go back to the uh, back to the Pixelmator. And I think that would be an effective use of this tool. So you can, ask, you can set out your different aspect ratios. And then again, you can save this as a preset. Okay, so there's that. Uh, let's go, let's get out of here. I'm going to cancel that. And let's go back into the What's New in Pixelmator Pro again. Oops, come back here. And the next one is Touch Bar. I don't have a Mac with a Touch Bar. If I did, you would now have control for that. But if you've got a MacBook Pro with the Touch Bar across the top of the keyboard, now there are funky things for Pixelmator built into that. Cool beans. Um, next one, Auto Color Adjustments. So you have automatically Automatic Color Adjustments for, there's only three adjustments. It is White Balance, Lightness, and Hue and Saturation. Wait for this to load. Here we go. Auto White Balance, Auto Lightness, and Auto Hue and Saturation. So let's just pick a photo. i um, actually open a different picture for this. Um, I think, is this, I think I'd picked one earlier. Is this it? No, that's not it. Um, oh shoot, maybe it's gone. Oh, we'll just use this one. So you got this picture here. If I go into my, um, my image editing effects here, you've got, let's just do a complete reset on everything in here. I've got white balance. You see there's an auto button next to white balance in there. I've got lightness. There's an auto button next to that. And if I add in hue and saturation, there's an auto next to that as well. So on this scene, I don't think it's going to change anything, but I hit auto. It thinks about it for a while. See the little, it's really thinking before it does it. Now, the reason that it's doing that, if you read the description on this, is this is not um, just a standard auto white balance looking for white and, and doing it. It is actually a, an AI image analysis looking at it, comparing it, I believe, to a database of other images of what is known to be accurate. Adobe's doing a similar thing right now. I think Google's been doing this for a while. Um, where it is, it is not just enhancing it based off of some parameters that some engineer came up with. It is actually analyzing other similar images, optimizing for what the algorithm believes should be should look good. So it's in my experience, these type of algorithms are better than just the the generic one clicks. Um, they're still you know, sometimes wrong, but it's a good place to start. Right? It's a very fair place to start. See if your image gets better, and sometimes you go, oh, well, I'm good with that. Move on to the next picture. And sometimes you hate it completely, and sometimes you go, oh, it's close, but I want to go tweak it a little bit more than that. Totally up to you. So let's say I did auto white balance. Just do auto hue and saturation in there. No change, auto lightness. Um, and it's going to brighten it up just a little bit. So very, very minimal changes in there for this particular photo. But, um, but it's doing it. It's doing it. All right, next up is, I, need, I keep needing to bring up the menu here because it closes away. So the slice tool that was part of Export for Web, so we looked at that. Advanced compression, now this is kind of interesting because I can't figure out where to turn this on. So advanced compression, it says in here, shrink image sizes to the smallest possible without losing quality, up to 70% smaller. And it does point out specifically PNG images, which is interesting because JPEGs are what most people would use. Um, but here's the thing, I don't know what it's talking about because there's nothing to turn on in the preferences. So you can import, uh, transparency, reset, show tool tips, viewing. Nope. Under rulers, there's nothing to here because that's just rulers. Okay, so I go to export. Oh, there's got to be something in the export menu, right? So I go to export. Uh, there's nothing here. Nothing there about advanced. It did say PNG, so I go to PNG, and there's nothing. I can choose my color profile, um, but there's nothing about advanced. So I don't really know what it means by if you choose. See, it says in here, when you turn on advanced compression. So I don't really 
really know where you're supposed to turn that on. So I don't know if that got included in here, but didn't get included in the update or what, but it's, you know, somewhere in there. I don't know. Not my app. Okay. Um, next one is, let's go back into the help again. What is new? Um, quick export. So that is a couple things. That is the presets that we just looked at, but also up here in the top right, when you click on the export window, the quick export settings that you've saved. So you can save those in. If you go to export, um, export for web, you can save those presets. These are the presets that have already been saved out. So you've got that. You can say, I want a JPEG, 80%, 1x. Oh, no, that's interesting. Hold on a second. Let's go back into this. If I load up this 80%, well, now where are they getting the 80%? Because it's not changing it in there. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, maybe here, here's an advanced. So maybe that's the advanced that it's talking about. That's the only place I see it. Curious. Curious indeed. So presumably that will be smaller than a standard PNG. Alrighty. That says it's going to be 3.3 megs. If I go PNG advanced, it says it's going to be 3.2 megs. Not exactly a huge difference in there. Oh, there's the advanced compression. Ah, ha, ha, ha. I found it. This is why we do these things live. So this little triangle there, use advanced compression. There you go. Using several advances, but slower algorithms. Alrighty then. Okay, well, so cool. Now we know where that is. And let's just make sure, is, it, is there anything under JPEG there? No, there's not quality. Oh, so there's our quality. That's what the 80% is. That was 80% quality JPEG, not sizing. So you don't have, you still do not have the ability to scale on export other than the half 1x, 2x, 3x. Interesting. Hmm. Kind of wish you had that, because that's, is that really, hold on, let me go back to the um, standard export dialog and see, I feel like, I feel like I must be missing something here. Um, command, okay, Command Shift E is taking us to this export dialog, so let's go standard exports, just Command E. Yeah, this is still missing. It's still missing the ability to scale on export. That's weird. That to me is something we really need. All right, I got a full-size picture, but I want to export out a 1024 wide version of it. I don't want to have to scale the image export it, and then undo the scaling. Hmm. Okay, well, it's still missing that. All right. Next up is, let's go back to this. Next up is advanced compression, quick export, export presets we talked about, um, SVG scalar vector graphics. So if you are doing SVG um, uh, web stuff, you can do that. HEIF, high efficiency image format. So that is the new um, image file format, I guess. And that is the new image file format that is on iPhones with iOS 11. That is what you're shooting on your iPhone and iOS 11, unless you've disabled it. Actually, it might be disabled by default. I don't remember now. Anyway, it is the new high efficiency codec so that you get a much higher rate of compression without losing any image quality, um, but not everything can read that. So you now have the ability from here to export out to that, which is awesome. If you have a destination that you know will take the HEIF, then bonus. If you're unsure, use JPEG, play it safe. Live previews. So live previews, I kind of thought we had this before in here. I guess I'm just so used to seeing it everywhere else. But let's say that I add some text. So I'm going to just hit a text layer in there. There we go. And as I go through and I change my fonts, you'll see that previewing happening automatically or instantly up there. Um, if I go into the styles and I change the blend mode, as I scroll through them, I'm seeing it on there. Um, which, oh, that's interesting. You can hold the preview. Well, that's happening automatically. I don't actually have to click it. Wait, hard light. That's interesting. Sometimes I click it, sometimes I don't have to. Huh. It's like it's an approximation until you hit it. Okay, so maybe that's more of what it is. You're actually getting the ability to do a full, full render preview of it. It seems like it's giving you an approximation until you do that, and then you hit it, and it gets a little more accurate. No, that's not right. Oh, it's turning the preview on and off. Oh, okay. Good job, genius. Um, there you go. It's turning the preview on and off. So there are the previews off. You see nothing's happening. Turn the preview back on. Oops, back here. Turn the preview back on. This just came out. Give me a break. Um, turn the preview back on, and now we're seeing it. Okay, so that's cool. So if your system is too slow, it's not handling that, you could turn it off. Otherwise, just leave it on. I see no point in turning it off. Okay, excellent. So there's our previewing. Um, so that is that definitely is new. That was not there before. Select color range um, and then tutorials. So we'll come back to select color range. Select tutorials, so there's a whole new set of tutorials in here you can follow. I'm presumably following these new features because uh, there already were tutorials. And then select color range is the last feature we're going to take a look at. So if we, let me get rid of uh, this text layer. You saw before in the selection video that we did, you have color selection in here. 
Now you have the select color range. Now color selection, if I did color selection and I click on this green here and I start to drag it out, it starts to select the green, but it doesn't select all the green until I draw this out bigger and bigger and it selects more and more of it. Okay, so if I wanted to, let's actually do a different example. Instead of that, let me do the, the red roof on the house. So I get that red roof on there. And see, as before it even gets to the other red roofs, it's gotten so expanded that it's getting other stuff. So I'd have to go, okay, I got that red roof, and then make sure add is selected. Let's go into 100%, so it's a little easier to see. I need to add that. Oop, no, nope, gotta be careful, gotta be careful. and just add that on there. And you know, see, I added this that I don't want, so I'm gonna hold on the option, deselect. So it could be a little tedious to get exactly what you wanted in here. Now you've got select color range. And then you simply, with the eyedropper that is loaded by default, click, and it automatically selects everything in that range. And then you can, you can restrict the range from here. So you can now, you can still, um, actually, can you still add? I guess, no, it, it changes it. It's, yeah, it's just a change. So you can, you can click on a new one, hold down the option button that brings you up back of your magnifying glass, um, click on a new range and it selects that. And so, um, so you can select the range that way. So different selection tools in there, different selections. And then once you hit apply, it turns that mask into a selection. So now you can do whatever you'd want to do to that selected range in there. So a couple of different selection tools in there. It's always good to see these other options coming in. Um, I'm not sure exactly how I'd use either of these, but, um, but it's good to have these options to select your colors and ranges in different ways. So that's all the new stuff. So the only reason we did this is because it just came out um, sometime between last week's show and, and today's show, and um, this is the last Pixelmator show, so I wanted to make sure we had a chance to cover that. So that, my friends, is that. Next week, we're starting on a completely new app. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. You're going to have to go check the website to be surprised. Go to PhotoOps.Expert, and you'll see what that is. Um, with that, folks, we're out of here. Take care of yourselves. I hope you enjoyed learning about Pixelmator, and if I missed anything dramatic and you're like, dude, you never covered this feature, let me know, drop me an email, tweet, Facebook, whatever, and uh, I'll insert an extra video somewhere along the line to cover that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I got everything here. Take care of yourselves, everybody. Bye-bye.